Yes, right now, we must have the whole truth. This is the true life, coming to you live from live tapes. The answers to all your questions. We don't need false prophets. We don't need misinformed teachers that don't know how to teach. We don't need leaders that don't know how to lead. That's right, he's here right now with us on earth, incarnated in human form with the total truth. True, true. You have to hear it to believe it. نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله والي الكريم وصلى الله على أنبياء أجمعين والمسيح والمحتي والمجدد لمن مرسلين Are we not the bearers of witness that nothing would exist if Allah didn't create it and that he is alone and has no partners and that all gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the sustainer of all the boundless universes. All gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the generous eternal friend. And send salutations of Allah on all of his prophets and his apostles. And on the Messiah, the anointed one. And on the Mahdi, the guy. And on the Mujadda, the reformer. Which was all sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send greetings and we send peace throughout the boundless universe to all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. You are now listening to The True Light with Asaeed al-Imam Isa al-Hadi al-Mahdi in a live question and answer session. In the scriptures, it's clear that it says... Which scripture? Uh, the King James Bible, the King James Version. Okay. okay. And uh, there it's clear that it's Arabic language and Hebrew language. I'd like to know which one of those languages, oh, how do you say, came first, and how can I see this and prove this through the scriptures? <laughs> Neither one of those languages came first. <laughs> Neither one. Neither one of them, because Arabic and Hebrew are the same language. They are dialects of the same language. <laughs> and the language that the scriptures have come was Syretic Arabic, or Syretic Hebrew. It's the New Zealand language that Father Abraham, or Ibrahim, spoke. And they called him an Arab, not in relation to who's in Saudi Arabia today, but because the word Arab in the language meant a person who wandered from place to place or moved around. Because in Arabic, when we see Arab, we call a car an Arab. A car is Arabia. It's something that drives around. You understand? And so when Ibrahim and his family, when they Yabra, Abra, Nahr, when they crossed over the river of Euphrates and Tigris, the people who was in the valley called the Phoenicians, when he left Old Jadir, called him Abra to come from one side to the next, which later became known as Hebrew. You understand? When he migrated up to the land of Haran, wandering, setting up altars, they said he is a Arab, one who moves from place to place. As he raised his flocks in different places, they called him here Bedouani, uh, camel raisers and sheep raisers. As history holds it, man with ignorance has now turned these into tribes. These are Bedouins, these are Arabs. These are Hebrews, when they were all the same people in the time of Abraham and speaking the same language. So it's not whether Arabic or Hebrew came first. Arabic and Hebrew are the same language. So when you go down to the Hebrew language, and you ba, right, ta, gemal, dal, ha, you go to the language, and I need ba, te, te, jim, he, he, in Arabic, you got the same language. There is no P in Hebrew, there is no J in Hebrew. They added a P and they added a J when it became Yiddish. You see? Which is a combination of other European languages. The original Hebrew and the original Arabic are the exact same language. And they both come from our father, Ibrahim. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so ruthless 
that in the Quran he directs Muslims to follow Abraham's religion. Throughout the Quran, when Muslims maliciously, after the Prophet Muhammad, have turned and made a new religion, and it's become Muhammad's religion. And they, and they worship hadith and books of men when the Quran openly is telling them to follow Abraham's religion, which would mean that all the covenants that apply to Ben Israel would apply to Ben Ismail. They would be the same family again. They would have come back together under one covenant. You follow? But egotistical human beings who want to be leaders have split the family of Abraham again. And thus you have people calling themselves Arabs, and you have people calling themselves Israelis, etc. That's just the work of Shaitan again, just as busy as he could be, with no silsila, no root to any truth or fact, just their opinion about what they think English translations of the Quran are saying. And it's a sad thing, because many souls are getting lost by ignorant people who want to be leaders. Leaders are not made, they are born. I was wondering if you can show me all the quotes in the Bible where Jesus, I mean, where the Creator introduced other prophets as his only sons. Go to Psalms 2. Okay. This is talking to David. You know David, the father of Solomon, yes. who received the Psalms? Make note of what he says. Why do the heathens rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying. Now stop. When you see the word anointed, that's the Hebrew word Misha or Misha or Messiah. Okay, they call him David a Messiah. Okay? Now what do they say? Let us break their bond asunder and cast away their cords from us. The kings of the earth and the rulers of the earth set out to destroy Israel. The kings of the earth and the rulers of the earth did not set out to destroy Jesus. Just the Romans. You follow that? And they had empress, not kings. So that's another one. Go on. Number four. He that sitteth in heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. The Heavenly Father is laughing at these people who try to destroy Israel and will have them doing, you know, in derision, going all kind of crazy ways. Five. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sword of flesh. Then the Almighty will send a wrath down on them, right, and vex them. Rome, the Roman Empire did not get a wrath down on them during the period of time of Jesus' crucifixion. In fact, according to the Christians, after that, all the disciples started getting persecuted and burnt and tied and right? So this means it's still talking about, I'm just showing you how this can't be talking about Jesus. Now we go on to six. Yet I have set my king upon his holy mountain of Zion. Whatever that is, the Lord says he put his king. Who was, what was David called? King David. And he was over the new city of Jerusalem. At the time, that's not the city of Revelation. David had the temple of Solomon originally built. And that was the first sign. Okay? We're still talking about David. I will declare a decree. The Lord hath said unto me. Now he's talking David in the first person. What does it say there? Read it to me. Thou art my son. Go ahead. At this day have I begotten. That's the same quote that Christians use for Jesus. Right? But this is talking about David, not Jesus. This is before David, Jesus was even conceived. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. And they said about Israel, that they were saved the uttermost part of the earth. Go on. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like the potter's vessel. Jesus did none of those things. Go ahead. Yeah. Ten. Be wise. Now, therefore, O king, talking to Israel, be instructed, ye judges of the earth, talking to the judges that are mentioned in the book of Israel, the kings, and then the book of Judges, you follow? Yeah. 
serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, talking about David again, because he was the king. Let him be angry and he perish from the way, because he had the power to put you to death, is what Israel would do if you disobeyed the king. When his wrath is kindled, but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Now read the next line, what does it say? A psalm of David, when he fled from Absalom's son. It goes on to give you another psalm. Let's go on to the third. You follow? So that's a, a direct quote. Well, David is called the begotten of the father. Now let's go back to Genesis, to pluralize it. Genesis chapter 6, right? And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, correct? Yes. What happened? That the sons of God. Go back and read the, the third word again. The sons of God. Is that plural? Yes. That's right. That the sons of God saw what? The daughters of men that they were dead. Now go down and read number four. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men. Now here the Bible again is saying God has more than one son. Correct? Yes. We can go on to the lindacy of Jesus according to the Bible in the book of Luke, and we're going to get where they call Adam the son of God. Luke chapter 3, verse 38. You got it? Give it time. Now, if you would have read all before this, it starts giving you the son of this, the who's the son of this, who's the son of that, who's the son of this, right? Yes. Then when you get down to 38, which says, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of who? Adam. Who was what? The son of God. You understand? Yes. This can go on and on throughout the Bible. They don't know what they're talking about. They made this up. Now, people want to understand what they mean that Jesus is the Son of God, then they should ask. Because it has a lot to do with the languages of the scriptures. You follow? Yes. And when they translate into English, they only have one word for son. And you all use it so many different ways. You have S-U-N, of course, which is a genetic, it's not the genetic son, but S-O-A is used so much out of context. Now, a boy who's adopted by a man is called his what? Son. And a boy who's conceived by a man is called his? Son. But in Hebrew, in the Semitic languages, it's not the same word. See, when a boy is conceived by someone, he's called what is it? Wa, la, da. Okay? But when he is adopted, he's called Ibn. Or Ibnu, son of. And whenever they speak about Jesus or anybody in the Bible other than the angels, they use Ibn Allah, the son of by adoption. When they speak of the angels, they use Ibn sometimes because they are conceived out of Allah's life. You see? That's the trick. In the language, a minor language translation problem is where they got all this confusion. Was Jesus the son of God? Yes. But just like everybody else is the sons and daughters of God. What did Jesus say in Matthew? When the first line of the Lord's Prayer is what? Our Father. He did not say, my Father. Now, if Jesus was God, tell me what the second line says. Our Father what? Who art in... I thought Jesus was God on earth. Jesus just made a statement that the Father was in heaven. And he's the one I'm talking. Pray me after this manner. Our Father, including himself, who art in... Heaven. Now they say, you get married in the name of Jesus Christ and do this in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, hallowed be thy name, your name. The Jehovah Witness say that Jesus has a kingdom. Jesus said, thy kingdom come. Jesus said, you must do the will of him. According to Christians, Jesus said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now that man who's talking there is not the father of the religion they're calling Christianity. Because that first couple of lines right there contradict the whole Christian faith. Our father eliminates him being a personal son. 
who are in heaven, eliminates the fact that Jesus, that the Christians say that God was inside Jesus on earth. Holy is thy name, eliminates the fact that Jesus' name is special. Thy kingdom come, eliminates the fact that Jesus had a kingdom. Thy will be done, eliminates the fact that we should obey anybody but the Heavenly Father. On earth as it is in heaven, and all of this was in future tense. Didn't even happen yet. These people lied. They ate the Romans, who were men worshippers, and worshipped the God called Zeus. They put that I as Zeus and created the word Jesus. And have people thinking that they're worshipping the Messiah or the Father through the Messiah, and they have them working the Roman, have them worshipping the Roman God Zeus. Salaam alaikum. Um, I was wondering, you know, during the cut and so forth, we have your minbar, and what is the essence of standing up and, and sitting down while you're reading the cut and, you know, you're towards the congregation and you're asking questions or actually you're reading your cut but I want to know what was the essence of standing up and sitting down. Most of the, most of the imam, or a'ima, which is plural, or the shayukh, which is plural for sheikhs, were elder men. By the time they got the position, where they were allowed to lead a whole jama, they were older men. And the, and the khutbah were broken up into two parts. One was usually community affairs, because that's the most, uh, the, the only time in Islamic societies where everybody gathered together. And the second dealt with Quran and Sunnah. So what he would do to break the two parts up and to rest, because they would get up and yell and scream after the example of Rasulullah preaching. They would sit down as a resting point. And the reason why they would stand up is to be over the congregation because the original member, and this is interesting, the reason why a masjid is constructed the way it is, believe it or not, is the dome of a masjid, the round part, was like a, an observatory because in Israel, they had contact with extraterrestrials, which they were calling angels, that would descend in a whirlwind of light, which were ships. And those were observed, the dome in the, in the east of the mosque was observatories, and the member, to believe it or not, the word member comes from the word nar, light, like a lighthouse. That was a way to, that would be lit up, and that was a way to channel in where people would come in, extraterrestrials. That's, that's what it symbolized, like a, like a lighthouse. You understand? Yes. Every part of the masjid and every incident in it was ritualistic. Now, the steps on the member inside the masjid only had three steps originally in the first masjid, Qubba, they call it. And it had a step for youth, for adolescents, and old age. And Muhammad stood on one, Umar on another, and Abu Bakr on another when he would give khutbas. And he would sit down and relax in between the sermon and then stand up and teach again as a resting point. You follow? Yes. Because he would change notes from community affairs to the notes that were Quran and, and, and teachings. And now, as time passed, the amount of steps increased as the Sahab of Rasulullah became worthy to coming and standing. To the point where you have more companions than steps. So some mosques have 30 steps. Because they would stand there doing the khutbah in olden days. So when given the khutbah, is it, is it possible for you to, to write your own understanding that you said that uh, while giving the khutbah, it should be like Quran, you should be following it towards... But the khutbah is broken up into two parts. The first part should be your own community affairs, things pertaining to your community. The second part should be some lesson about whatever holiday is in that month, whatever, you found what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, sure. About the Hadith and the Quran, the Sunnah and the Quranic, some teaching uh, that Muhammad was trying to convey and always talk about the importance of, according to Rasulullah, Zakat and Jummah. And salah. Always. Shukran. The question I need to ask is, 
Uh, I'm trying to resolve something here in one of the handouts that I had got, uh, where it says, He has commanded blacks and Latin to keep their seeds seed pure. The point is, uh, you, in the last uh, answer to the last question, you mentioned the destruction of the Egyptian writings. Also, I have heard of the destruction of the Mayan and Aztec's writings. Uh, could you, in some way, bring all these points together, the Latins and the blacks, as well as the destruction of their, uh, their history, their writings? Could you resolve for me? Yeah, I'll do my best. Now, first of all, when we say Mayans, when we say Mayans, okay, we're saying illusions. In their language, the word Maya means illusion, something that doesn't exist, believe it or not. Now, different beings, the Aztecs, the Mayans, the people of Kutamas, of Central America, all these different tribes were no more than Indians who migrated from what we call Sinin, India, or Hind, all the way from China or Hind, and mixed with each other and went across the Barren Strait and down into America and then down into South America. They belong to the eastern part of the world where all of the spiritual light was coming, not in the west. The w spiritual light was coming in the east. This is why all of your prophets were on the eastern side of the planet and not here. You got your Buddha, your Zoroastrians, your Muhammad, your Jesus. Everybody came to a certain area. That was a spiritual center or the navel of earth because the Kaaba was there. All of these people's doctrine and languages come from the same language, Arabic. You follow? The first language spoken here. But all the languages of the world started off in Arabic. You follow that? Now, when you say Latins, you cannot mix up the Spartics, which were the Spaniards, with the Moranians, which were the blacks. When Carthagena under Hannibal, who was a worshiper of the god Baal, because a lot of blacks would like to think that Hannibal was a great Muslim, Hannibal was a worshiper of the god Baal. His name is Hannah Baal. Glory be to the god Baal. You follow that? When they moved, when they got pushed out of Italy, you remember the, you know the story of Hannibal and the, and the elephants and the war they tried? Well, they took over the northern region of Africa and they migrated to what was called Morania, which is now called Morocco. And then they took Spain and set up Alhambra as an Islamic community when Hannibal was overthrown and they spread across North Africa, they converted to Deen al-Islam and they took over the whole northern region of Africa. Then the Spartics, called Spaniards, Anglic, these were like the Anglics, the Saxons, the Spartics, did what they always do. They took one of them, called El Cid, who had an Arabic name also, and used him because he knew when those people in Northern Africa would be making prayer, he knew when they worshipped, he knew how they lived, and he took them and told them when to attack and conquer Spain. So in 722, they conquered Spain and mixed in with them. When they saw the black, beautiful women of Morocco, they mixed their blood. Thus, you have the Spanish, a combination of the original Nubian of the northern region of Africa mixed in with the Spartics or what they call the Spaniards. You follow? and they suppressed their religious culture and dominated them with the Catholic faith and th then they migrated and went down to, to Portugal and they moved from Portugal, the blacks who wanted to maintain their culture down to a part of Africa referred to as Angola which is Portugal, Angola and the other ones migrated in different directions and went to one place called Florida meaning place of many flowers and another was Port Rico, which became known as Puerto Rico. And the people, after being there, which were these original blacks from Morocco, after being there for a long period of time, became known, of course, as Puerto Ricans 
or American blacks in America had now been referred to as Negroes or with a little respect American Negroes but they're still descendants of Nubia I'm trying to show you how they submerge all of it so now when you meet a black American he can't speak nothing but English or what he called not even English he speaks American and he's lost identity with who he is that is the devil's purpose was to divide and conquer us the Latino what you see the Puerto Rican is nothing but a black Arab like yourself the Africans are nothing but the sons of Cush and the sons of Mizraim and the sons of Ham who were the descendants of Noah who migrated into Africa when Arabia became barren and, and spread across Africa and all of Africa are nothing but Cushites, Nubians, Hamites and Shemites. So there is no difference between a person from Malaysia, Mauritius, uh, certain parts of India, all through parts of Arabia, all up into Africa, and straight on over to Morocco, which, in, which would include at times portions of the tips of Italy, as well as Spain. All of those people would be original black people whose seeds have been poisoned by the devil, who maliciously set out to do that so he can distract us from our evolution back to divinity. We are evoluting back towards being more mental, men more mental than physical. And he has to detour that by any means possible. Okay? So basically what the question is that Aztecs, the Mayans, and all those were all the same people. If you really check, you see the structures of the pyramids that they built are the same. Their mathematical codes are the same. And when you look at the, the languages, all you see is an alteration in the alphabet, but the grammatical structure and the phonetics stay the same. You, know, you say like the word Aztec. You see the word Aztec. That can that's the same. That's a, that's a phonetic in Arabic. That Aztec is an Arabic tone or Hebrew or Phoenician or Aramic. The tones give it away. You don't hear the tones that are in the Semitic languages. When a person starts speaking in Spanish, you can hear the tones in the language. When they say Aki, which means here, it means brother in Arabic. Aki. You follow? And they say Muslim, Muslim, they use Muslim, they say Muslimino or Muslimun, it's the same word. So in Latin, they're using the sack, the, the, the Latin people are being split up by places the same way a lot of Africans are being told they're Nigerians because they're in a place called Nigeria, or they're Ghanaians because they're in a place called Ghana, or they're Sudanese because they're in a place called Sudan, or you're Puerto Rican because you're from a place called Puerto Rican, or you're Cuban because you're in a place from Cuba, or you're Jamaican because you're from a place called Jamaica, and that's the biggest game the devil got. And the moment you open your mouth and he has an accent, then he wants to know what your nationality is. Merely meaning, what nation is yours? Because na most people associate nationality with their genes. It has nothing to do with their genes. When I say, what is your nationality, I really mean, what nation do you reside in? And if you say, well, I'm from France, they say, oh, black Frenchman. How interesting. Next thing they ask you, can you speak French? <laughs> of course, I was born in France. I should speak French. Oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> and there are people like from uh, Panama, you know, who have white on their birth certificate, and they're blacker than you and me. Just another one of his games, all right? I hope I helped you. In one of your pamphlets that I've been reading, you mentioned that Jesus was not crucified. And, you know, I've been also reading the, um, this book by Sean Feld on the Passover plot. So I was wondering if there's any way you can like, enlighten me on this point, because if so, then in Matthew and Mark, you know, in the epistles of these um, apostles, they stated that there was a crucifixion. So I'm wondering if it was like partial crucifixion and he was just unconscious or was it a, you know, thorough crucifixion and then this resurrection as stated by the so-called Christians. This is something that I would like cleared up this evening if possible. Thank you. First of all, a lot of people, especially in the Muslim world, try to give people the impression that Jesus was on the cross and taken down while yet alive in a coma state, etc. And this is not true because the Arabic word salib means crucifixion. Taqil means to kill. And the Quran says they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. 
I'll go through different points to cover that. But first I want to point out some of the things that people seem to overlook. All right? Thank One you. of them is that the person who was on the cross, who they claim was Jesus, said, I thirst. Jesus himself had the power to turn water into wine. Jesus himself had the power to put flesh and bones and blood back together on a dead body of Lazarus after rigor mortis. Jesus himself had the power to walk on water, levitate. You follow? Yes. Can you imagine a person with these powers dropping to the point where they say, I'm thirsty? <laughs> now their answer would be, because as he was dying, he became a man. Well, if Jesus became a man for one second, then he never was God. Because the one thing that Allah, or as they call him, God, cannot do, and that's a question I've asked people many times, what is the one thing that the Heavenly Father cannot do? And the answer is quite simple. He cannot become less than himself and still be the omnipotent. You see that? And for him to have died for one fraction of a second on a cross to make a transition or anything of that nature would be becoming less than himself. So we established that whoever was on the cross, they were a man. And they actually separated themselves from the Almighty when they said, My God, my God, as they translated, why have thou, you, separated from me, forsaken me. Now, if Jesus the Messiah was predicted to come from Isaiah to Jeremiah, all the way down to the prophets, you see, and that he would come into the world to die for your sins, born of a virgin, etc., he knew he was going to die. He told his disciples he was going to die, according to them. Where, in any point of this Bible, do we find the Almighty Father forsaking him? At any point. Jesus had pain, according to them, before he even reached the cross. They were abusing him when he was being, had a, a, a thorn reap put on his head. I mean, they just abused Jesus. Okay? They say that this man on the cross was God and the Son of God in one. I'm just going to go around little things. All right? Now, when... The two men beside him questioned him. He told one of those men that he would be in heaven with them that day. Correct? Yes. But the prophecy was that he would be in the bowels of the earth three days and three nights. Somebody made a mistake. Because in order for him to be in heaven that day, he couldn't have been in the bowels of the earth three days and three nights. You understand? I got it. Another problem is, Jesus is supposed to, when being in the tomb, resurrected to the point where he was a spirit, with enough energy to leave an impression on a cloth, which they call a shroud. Right? Yeah. Yet, they say, somebody moved a stone for him to get out. Now, if he was a spiritual being with the power to go through the cloth, why did they have to move the stone for him to get out? If he was a spirit, he could have went right through the stone. You see the point? Another thing is, the soldiers told them, while we were asleep, the disciples came and took him away. Right? Well, if they was asleep, how do they know who came and took him away? This goes on and on. The discrepancies go on and on. What was written on the top of the cross? Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Jesus the Messiah, King of the Jews. The King of the Jews. All the disciples wrote a different story about what was said. Now the Holy, uh, let's say, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. You, you know, the point that I'm trying to make is then why are these um, evangelists and preachers, black ones included, you know, spreading this um, 
this false gospel. And our people there, like, I mean, millions of people following these different TV evangelists and they're supporting them, you know, by their tithes and that sort of thing. So what I'm wondering, who is going to spread the word to our black people that they're attending a church that is telling them lies? <laughs> you know, you know, I know it, you cannot save all of them. I'm not sure of this, but I'm I know. saying it breaks my heart, you know. Well, you know, the thing about that is, the question you asked was a very good question because you asked, who's telling the story? And it is just that. The white man admits, he calls it the greatest story ever told. And also he tells you, don't call your little brothers and sisters liars. Tell them, when they, do, when they tell a lie, say they told a story. The greatest story ever told is that God came down to earth in the form of a man and died for your sins. That's such a good cop out. That means... That me and you could be sitting in a car, right? Yeah. And you could be driving at 100 miles an hour and crash it up and I die. That's so convenient. And if Jesus came into the world to remove sin, then why is every day the news saturated with sin? Now they made these stories up because the people combined Jah of Israel and Zeus of Rome to control the reformed Jews. The Sanhedrin and all those people had lost control over the Israelites because those so-called Israelites were becoming impressed by the new Roman Empire that was taken over. So he had to create a doctrine that was neutralized, that let them worship his god Zeus and their god Jaho, which they combined and got Jesus, Jesus. Then, because their God could die, who was Caesar, you follow? Yes. They had to kill the God of Israel. So they said that your God died. <laughs> so Jah, under the name Jesus, died, and Zeus, under the Caesars, died. So it makes the gods, you know, of Rome and Israel the same when Jesus purposely told them to not mix the seed of the Roman doctrine with that of God. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto the Lord what is the Lord's. You understand? Yes, I do. So throughout those scriptures, they cannot show me anywhere where it says Jesus died and they saw it. Paul, in the Corinthians, what he says is that Jesus died according to the scripture. He doesn't say he's seen it. He says right here in um, the first Corinthians chapter 15. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which is the teachings, right? Which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein you stand. Paul is telling them, I'm going to give you a gospel, same one I'm teaching, but you already have gotten it, these books, some, from somebody else. And you base your law on this gospel. All right, this is the first Corinthians chapter 15. All right? Yes. Then he says, by which also ye are saved. Meaning, by this gospel that I preach, as well as what you receive, this is how you shall be saved. Now, he then altered the means of salvation. Because Luke says, your salvation comes through baptism. Paul's saying, by you keeping the gospel, you're saved. So they ain't got two different teachings. All right, let's go on. So the point that you're making is that after, you know, after um, Jesus, I would say, you know, left and was into some other ministry or something like this, Paul and the other apostles, you constantly in your pamphlets refer to Paul as the self-appointed um, apostle. So you're saying that he started a new, a new doctrine. Exactly. Paul fabricated his own teachings. I see. And none of his teachings complied to that which Jesus taught. So I find then it's, um, then it's compatible then that these false prophets in the churches then usually refer to Paul more than they do to Jesus. All the time. All right. They actually take, if you look at Romans 4, 15, for the law brings wrath, right? This is yeah. what Paul says. But the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. Now what is this man saying? This is the book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 15. Can you, you all, have you all found that? Yeah, not sure. 
I haven't found it yet, but I'm listening. Okay? So what he's going against is Jesus' teachings when he says in St. John's that the Lord came by Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Correct? Yes. And that they should obey the law. Not one jot nor tittle shall be removed from the law. This is Jesus' teachings. We follow the law of Moses, he kept saying. Now, Paul comes along in his own book, the book of Romans, and, to, and refutes that by saying what? You got it? This chapter 5, you? Chapter 4 of Romans, oh. verse 15. Okay, great deal. Um, it says here, because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. So he's telling people here that the law is what's going to bring the wrath on you. So if you people don't have no laws, you ain't got to worry about transgressing against them. <laughs> and Jesus is saying something different. Jesus is saying, obey the law or you're going to hell. He's not giving them an alternative of eliminating the law. You see what Paul just did? And then if you read it, you find out Paul also eliminated the circumcision. He eliminated the baptism. He changed all these laws. And that's why Christians now, whenever you talk to a Christian preacher, he don't quote Jesus. He quotes Paul. Well, this is what I, you know, this is one of the things that turned me out of the church because... I am a thinking person, and I usually come home and check whatever they say. I, I don't take the word for granted. I'm even checking your words, too. And I, just, I, I, really, I really want y'all to, because that's what's important. You know, so, I, you know, this had me a little mixed up, because most of them refer to Paul, and what he says is like law. And nobody talks about Jesus that actually brought the revelation, you know, in Well, look the at this. Turn to Luke 16, 17, and let's see what one of the so-called disciples who saw Jesus says. That's what we got to do. Whenever you deal with a preacher, what I do is I try to stay in the scriptures. You know what I'm saying? Yes, so do I. So that they can't play no games with you. And if you, if you stay, if you got them places and if you can walk through that scripture, nobody can deceive you. So when they get into their philosophical interpretations that everybody gets lost. You see what it says there? This is Luke. Um... 16, 17. Okay, I'll get it. I'm a little slow turning these pages. That's all right. Want me to read it? Okay, go ahead. Thanks. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Yes, I see it. Now, that's one of the people who was with Jesus. Now, I hear this other man who says he, on the road to Damascus, he had his own little vision, and he alters what Jesus says in Romans 4.15. You understand? Yeah. Then in Romans 4.11, he received circumcision as a sign or seal of the righteousness which he had by faith while he was yet still uncircumcised. That's Paul again. Now, we know the circumcision went back to Abraham and was a covenant in Israel as well as Ishmael, right? Yes. And that the Bible said that Jesus was circumcised when the eight days came for a circumcision that he was circumcised, correct? Yes. Now, Paul is here eliminating the circumcision, taking laws out. What the Christians got to realize is it's not the Bible, it's the books that were added to the Bible by Paul. And that they are refusing to live by what Jesus said because Paul was a person who changed his name from Saul, or a Hebrew name, to Paul, a Greek and Roman name. You follow? That's like a person who don't want to take on an original Arabic name, yet call himself John Muhammad or Betty Muhammad. They want to continue to keep names like Paul wanted to change it from, but yet Paul says, which is funny, when he was on the road to Damascus, when Jesus spoke to him, what did Jesus speak to him in? Hebrew and called him Saul, Saul, you see. So Jesus, in that case, if that was Jesus talking to him from heaven, if Jesus called you Saul, and you say Jesus is God, what right do you got to go around and call yourself Paul? You understand? Yes, I do. So the thing that Christians have got to be told is that they got to stop following what Paul taught, and they got to start following what Jesus taught. Paul spread the teachings that they should teach the Gentiles in Acts 15, 9, and 21. And Jesus told them that he could not teach the Gentiles in Matthew 15, 28, he was only sent to the Lord's sheep of the house of Israel. Only. 
in St. John's 1. I came to my own. My own receiveth me not. But Paul, who was associating with the Gentiles because he didn't want to associate with Jesus' brother James and them, he brought the doctrine to the Gentiles and said, well, because the Israelites didn't accept it, I'll give it to the Gentiles. But he did not have the right to do that. And nowhere in Jesus' lifetime did he give the doctrine over to the Gentiles. It's a big game. You follow? Yes, I thank you very much. I've noticed that a lot of uh, the males in the community um, have their heads shaved. And I was wondering, like, if a so-called Rasta man were to come to class and decide to move into com the community and all that, um, would this be necessary uh, for him to shave? And I've also noticed that um, the avatar that comes through you, he has long hair. Does he? That's a question. I, mean, I, I have I've long hair too. My hair is shoulder length. Oh, okay. My hair goes down to my shoulders. I mean, I, and I've seen that that uh, that illustration too, where your hair is down to your shoulders. Right. I was wondering, why do the men shave their heads? And <laughs> first, <laughs> that's a very innocent question. You sound so innocent. First of all, if a Rastafarian came in here and told me about dread, the first thing I'd say is Hala Selassie didn't have them, and neither did Marcus Garvey. So if the root of your congregation didn't have them, you somewhere along the line must have made that up. Okay? Let's establish that. If you go to Jamaica, all right, and you talk to a Rastafarian who identifies Hala Selassie as the, as the Messiah, then tell me why, up and from the day he visited Jamaica, all the way to the time he died, why he never had dreads. And also tell me, why Marcus Garvey, who's another root of the Rastafarian faith, how come Marcus Garvey never wore dreads? Marcus Garvey rose a red, black, and green flag, and the Rastafarians have an uh, Ethiopian flag. Not to mention, Haile Selassie is a dead giveaway because Haile Selassie is not a Hebrew name. It's a Amharic name, which is an Ethiopian name. And if he was from the tribe of Judah, the one thing he would have is a Hebrew name. He wouldn't have an Ethiopian name. And Amharic and Aramaic and Hebrew are not the same roots. Aramaic and Hebrew are the same root, and Amharic comes out of Coptic Christians, of which he was a Coptic Christian himself. All right. Then I would go into the Bible and I would tell them about the story of Solomon, and they're not talking about the most important word that everybody keeps look, overlooking in this locked thing is the word dread. The Bible does not say that Solomon had dreaded locks. Do you know what the word dread means? Beard and things like that. Dreaded, it means grossed out. It means, it, 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 look, it definitely, when you see a person, like some of the brothers that I've seen in Jamaica, who are from different reggae bands, their hair was dreadful. That is not what the scripture is talking about when they say locks. Because the Bible forbids a man to mow the corners of his beard or the locks. That means if you put your hand where your temple is, next to your ear, you notice that all the so-called Orthodox Jews have these little curls? Those are their locks. They used to twist those with wax. And you can take your hair, a black person, and not let it just mad like a French poodle, but you can twist it and oil it and it'll drop the way you see my hair. It'll drop down in locks. You follow that? That is what they're talking about. They're not talking about dreadful looking hair where you just let it just mad like a French poodle. It means twisting it and washing it and keeping it clean. That's what they did in Israel. They oiled it and, and waxed it. Okay? Now, the reason why people cut is because Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Muslims, if you're not going to take care of your hair properly, then cut it off. And there are people who will not take care of it. They'll just look like something. They just look like they got up out of the bed every, every even at six o'clock in the evening. They just refuse to take care of themselves. So he said, if you're not going to take care of your hair properly, then remove it. But your hair are antennas for electrical impulses. The longer, and but it must be healthy and taken care of, not just matted like a French poodle, as I said before. So brothers are told here when they come in, cut your hair off, 
get rid of all these three parts, get all this perm, this perm and this lard and this stuff out your hair, and let your hair grow back healthily and take care of it, or keep it cut and keep a tagia or a prayer cap on, one or the other. If you're not going to take care of it properly, then cut it. But I will not walk around and see people walking around with hair sticking up all kind of ways looking. It just is not Islam. Islam is very tidy. There's not a way of life in any religion they have that has as much laws on hygienic teachings as Islam. Okay? Mm -hmm. Well, Asr, and the word Asr, which has been translated mostly by the word time and all that, comes from the word Asir. Asir, to squeeze something. They call juice in Arabic Asir. Alright? This is saying, by, I swear, the word Ra in the beginning of a sentence in Arabic is called Qasima. And this is when Muhammad was being told by Andrew Gabriel, I'm telling you, I'm warning you, I swear, he said, by the time when the soul of man shall be squeezed forth from his body. He's speaking about a period of time. Now, by this, when man gets ready to make that, when that angel comes to snatch that soul of man out of his body, I tell you, based on that time and how near it is, in Malin Sana Lafi Khusr, man, or surely, the man is at a stage or at an age of human existence where he will be overcome by defeat, cast away, he will fail. Based on the, the stage man is at now, he is going to fail entering the garden if the soul is removed from his body. Alright? But then Allah says, Inna ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat Illa except al ladhina for they also amanu who are amant, amantu, amana, faithful, wa amila, and they work, amila, and they do things, and they work for what? A salih, a salih hat, to perfect themselves, to correct it, to patch it up, to fix it, to correct themselves. What do I sold it? And they try to turn other people, bil haq, by way of the facts, not just truth, haq, is a fact beyond any doubt. What do I saw this sabr? And they teach them to rip them facts. They have to have patience. Do you understand that? Man is playing games with time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given man so much. But you people are persistently, constantly tempting Allah. How long? Man is going to survive this ultimate temptation is petrifying. He also says in the Holy Quran, the 108 Surah, another very short one. Inna atainaka kautar. Inna, surely we, the na, Allah and his angels, atainaka, have given to you, ata, al kautar, an abundance of things utmost of things. You've got more than every other creature in all existence on this planet. You man. Speaking directly to Muhammad, in representation of all human beings. Inna We have given you more than you need, human beings. For suddenly, the Rabika went her. So for suddenly, so worship, the Rabika, is only for your sustainer, Muhammad. Don't worship anything else. Your job, your school, your future. For selling your rabika when her. And sacrifice. You're going to have to perform the same type of sacrifice of Abraham, Muhammad. He asked him to give up his only begotten son. As Job, Muhammad, to give up his whole ayub, as you call him. To give up his whole family and everything. But hold that faith. As Jesus, to give up his very life, you have to sacrifice Muhammad. He's talking to you. Inna atayna kal kautar fasalli irabika wanhar. So worship Allah and sacrifice. Now watch. Inna shani akal huwal abatar. And all those people who speak out against you, Muhammad, and say, oh, you have no offspring or no sons, they will be abatar. They will be cut off. Suddenly, inna shani akka, the bitter or the evil ones who hate you, huwa, he will be abatar, cut off. These are 
two very short sections in the Quran that's talking about how you people are wasting your time with all kinds of excuses. Allah 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 knows and He does not accept excuses. to the unshakable guidance and teachings of Asaid al-Imam Isa al-Hadi al-Mahdi, the undisputed man of our times. No one has allowed themselves to be questioned with such a variety of questions, only to fulfill the eager minds of many in search of the truth. Al-Imam Isa is the author of the most dynamic books in history, dealing with the truth, not theory, philosophies, or fairy tales. Just simple truth to all your questions, no matter what topic. How did Jonah survive three days and three nights in the belly of the whale? Does the Creator really sit on a throne? What and where is hell? Are angels extraterrestrial beings? Finally, the time has come for the whole truth to be heard. The Nubian Islamic Hebrew Mission would like to invite you to write or send questions to True Light, 719 Bushwick Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11221. The public is invited to newcomers class held every Sunday, 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the Nubian Islamic Hebrew Mission, 548 Hart Street, Brooklyn, New York. Assalamu alaikum.